And welcome once again to Community Viewpoint. I'm John Pollock, your host for this segment. And um, we are going to be uh, talking about a subject that is near and dear to my heart. This is uh, on my side here is uh, Kayan Engel, who is the Resource Manager and Management Officer for Nevada Division of Forestry. And I, I believe I met you with the Southern Nye County Conservation District. That's correct. Uh, you've come here with, uh, for some of our meetings what we, we've had through the past years when we're uh, broaching the subject of salt cedar uh, removal. And um, Cayenne has uh, a program with the Division of uh, Forestry for Nevada that uh, will help us remove those, those trees. So uh, Cayenne, uh, why do we have to remove those trees? What, what is so bad about the uh, salt cedars? Oh, salt cedars. So thank you for inviting me here today. And we're going to start off by just again, giving a broad stroke approach to talking about weeds. So John, what's a weed? It's something that you don't want that gets stuck in your clothes and <laughs> it, it, it kills your uh, regular uh, flowers and it's something that the snakes that go under, it's just, it just something that's unwanted. It can be, and exactly, the something that's unwanted is kind of the key here. So a weed is just a plant where you don't want it. However, salt cedar is more than just a weed. Salt cedar is a noxious, non-native, and invasive plant that is basically taken over a lot of the Southwest. So you see in this picture here, it was introduced in likely the late 1800s or so, and by the early 1900s, sometime between the 20s and the 50s, salt cedar had basically taken over a lot of our waterways throughout the Southwest. And at this point, we have about 2 million acres that are covered in salt cedar. When it invades an area, so versus just, versus just having a plant that's somewhere where you don't necessarily want it and can be problematic in your yard, salt cedar will take over by outcompeting other plants, and it's associated with degrading soils and reducing the biodiversity of an area. So you see this picture here, almost every shrub you see in that picture is salt cedar. It's a literal wall. And what you see here are the results of cutting it out. There's basically nothing left there at that point. So. Well, that's what people um, planted them for too, for uh, the shade and also a windbreak. Ideally. Plus it, they're ornamental. They, they, they kind of look neat when they're in bloom. They can be ornamental. They're originally brought here possibly for a erosion control, as you mentioned, for wind breaks. Um, they're not great for forage in part because of the reason they're called salt cedar. And what the, one of the reasons that salt cedar is their nickname is they have the remarkable capability to take up minerals from deep soil. And unlike other plants that have a really hard time in really salt and mineral rich soils, the salt cedar is able to take it up into its system and then basically spit out what it doesn't want. So a lot of the salts and really heavy minerals, it spits out through its leaves. And then those leaves fall off onto the ground. And that's in part what allows it to outcompete other species around it. They just take over. They yes. can, and they absolutely, when they come in, they just, this environment's fantastic. There are four of them. They're originally from, depending on which species you get, anywhere from China to the Eurasia area, and they are, as we keep saying, incredibly successful here. Yes. And their, their cousin is the uh, the Aethel? Their cousin is the Aethel, which at this point in time is kind of moderately invasive in some areas, but not nearly as bad as the salt cedar. So we tend to see the salt cedar around areas of lakes, ponds, rivers, any area where there's surface water. But additionally, the seeds can germinate so quickly that it is it will establish within 24 hours of any water anywhere. It really likes silty soil. Oils. So just because you don't have a year-round pond or stream, even an ephemeral wash in your area, salt cedar can still establish on people's properties, and that's what we're seeing in this area a lot. 
And we saw the, the river and the river banks. Mm -hmm. Now, was that all salt cedars there? Uh, yeah, that first picture we show, it's pretty much entirely salt cedars. There are in that, I know that specific site, which is along the Virgin River, closer to the mesquite area. Mm -hmm. And there are some patches of mesquites and some patches of cottonwood, but pretty much for the most part, there's some arrowweed there. The most part, what you see is entirely salt cedar. So it really changes a system. But in addition to changing a system, one of the reasons that we're very concerned about it establishing in the Pahrump area, which we've seen more and more over the last 20 years or so, is it's a fire risk. And part of what our agency does is wildfire response. So we actually do direct attack. And we really want to focus on prevention. And that's why it's important for us to talk to your viewers today about eradicating the salt cedar on your ground. The, the picture that you just saw was a salt cedar fueled fire that was that occurred in Laughlin in 2015 so very recently and the fire behavior is pretty incredible when you see it in person it burns hot it burns fast and it's dangerous mm -hmm. and so we don't want that around people in your town and structures so well one of the biggest problems with that is uh, when we were looking at the river over there, there was a Virgin River? No, it was a Virgin River. Now, if we removed all those uh, salt cedars from there, the, the water would have been, what, tripled, quadrupled? You're right. It is a prolific drinker. So an individual mature salt cedar tree, some studies have shown that they can use up to about 200 gallons of water a day. So that's a lot in a water-strapped environment like ours. And there's kind of a debate about the impact with waters along riverways, because if you had a natural community of willows and cottonwoods, they would yeah. also be drinking. Yes. But in your community here, you would naturally have much smaller shrubs that were much more water efficient. So tamarisk or salt cedar, tamarisk is another name for it. I might flip back and forth. Salt cedar actually kind of, kind of has an out of proportion impact around communities where you're using groundwater and wells than even along rivers where you do have that surface water. And we are so water conscious here, or most of us are, because we uh, rely on uh, groundwater mm -hmm. uh, from the, uh, the Spring Mountains, from the uh, Mount Charleston area, mm -hmm. and uh, our water table in many areas especially where, well, where I live, the, the water table has been going down almost a foot a year. Right. And uh, the, the man-made uh, reasons for it to, to go down is we're, we're using the water ourselves, but the fact that we have so many salt cedars here also, and each plant can drink up to uh, 200 gallons per day, multiply that by thousands of salt cedars through the area. So what you're proposing here uh, through the Southern Iconic Conservation District, uh, uh, the invitation's been out to you. Well, you and you mentioned to us that you have a, a way of removing these salt cedars at no cost to us. Correct. Our program right now is at no cost to your landowners. By the by, the state. Correct. The Division of Now uh, Forestry. And tell us how we can do that, uh, the, the folks here. Okay, so as John mentioned, we do have a program where we're working to eradicate, we can actually do the work on, on private property to eradicate salt cedar for some people. We have a pretty small amount of grant funds available now, but there's definitely the opportunity for the future, and there are some other opportunities through kind of the bounty program through your Great Basin Water, Authority, Great Basin Water District, yes. um, a Great Basin Water Company, yes. and also pass through, you may be able to get some chemical needed paid for through the Cooperative Weed Management Area, and I'll show you some of those other references. But first, it'll take knowing if you have salt cedar on your property, so let's talk about how you identify it, what it looks like. So salt cedar is a shrub, generally it can get up to probably about 15 feet or so here. Uh, it's between a kind of a shrub and a tree, it's always going to be really thick and really just shrub with a lot of multiple stems, as you see there from the picture on the right. One of its identifying factors is reddish bark on the young bark, but when the young stems get older, they do become furrowed and you get a more typical gray bark. In addition, they are covered with flowers for about three months a year, anywhere from white to pink flowers, and you can see that's just a ridiculous abundance of flowers that you get per plant, which means that you can get millions, literally millions of seeds produced per plant and almost all of those seeds can germinate and turn into another plant. So that's where you get the people uh, that are <laughs> pruning them because the, 
you can, it's like a poodle. You can make it look cute, okay? <laughs> Absolutely, uh, they're pretty minimal. And then it's hard to explain to some people because they look so good that they mm -hmm. can do so much jam damage, but they can, they will. And those little pink flowers, they turn in the, the seeds. Mm -hmm. Millions of tiny little yes. seeds. You can barely see them, just like little specks. So we definitely advocate that if you can take them out, you can replace them with some other water smart, native, maybe even landscaping that can yes. fill that role of a windbreak, a shade break, and even add in some pretty flowers for your insects. And if you ever come to the, the Earth Day, Arbor Day Festival in April, you always could get some uh, free saplings over there. So that's something to look forward to. Um, so that's how you identify it. Now, how do you treat it? Yes. That's kind of our next section, Oh, right? my goodness. Oh, let's do that. <laughs> All right. So treatment, there's the most common eradication techniques are a mix of, you can do what we call physical control, that if they're small enough, you can literally link, yank those seedlings right out of the ground, pull it out roots and all. But the salt cedar re-sprouts from the base if you don't get the base at the top of the root out of the ground. And you will get just hundreds and hundreds of re-sprouts if it's not taken care of properly. So you, uh, generally, the if you can't, if it's too big to just pull right out of the ground and make sure you get the, the at least the, that root with it, then your other options are going to be what we call mechanical. That's either using a chainsaw, a backhoe to dig it out, um, and an X excavator, sort of anything that you can access to actually either dig it out of the ground like we see in this picture here or cut it at the surface. And because it re-sprouts so vigorously, if you cut it at the surface, it will be back. And during the peak growth season, so say March through May, or actually probably March through more like July, you'll get up to a foot of growth on those re-sprouts each year. So they do need to be yes. treated with an appropriate herbicide, either on the stump or on re-sprouts that grow back, you can treat next season with a foliar herbicide. And there are a lot of references that you can Google and you can give basically any of those any, any of the agency people that you'll sort of, you know, or friends and people in town, the cooperative extension a call, give me a call, give the weed management area a call, and we can send you documentation and give you guidelines for what the most appropriate herbicides are and how to use them. We have uh, Kayan's phone number over there for the, the Division of Forestry. Oh, it's there a, we ooh, go. You got all that. Oh, yeah, I got yes. a lot of stuff. So yeah. look in the oh, okay. upper left. Again, if you can Google me or talk to someone with your local conservation district, we can get in touch. But we are looking for people to join our program, and we can come treat on your land at no cost um, or contact any of the other agencies that can help you with treatment on your own. So call those numbers, call the Southern Knight County Conservation District. Uh, we will get you in touch with uh, Kayan. It may not be tomorrow, it may be take uh, two, three months, but it will get done. So please uh, call us. So thank you, Kayan. Thank you. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next week.